Russ, glad to have you on the show today. I appreciate your time. Hey, before we get into what I think amounts to an unconventional or at least novel solution to this problem, let's quantify what has become, unfortunately, a very conventional or out of control problem. And that's the status of illegal immigration at America's southern border. As you look at the numbers and people are throwing around numbers that I think the American public has to sort of start putting their arms around. Governor Greg Abbott of Texas is saying 100,000 people are waiting at the Mexican border for Title 42 to be lifted. I think our record number in the past month was 250,000 encounters. Mm -hmm. So let's just kind of put the problem into context really quickly. Russ, what are we looking at happening on the southern border? Sure. So right now we have about 7,000 apprehensions per day. But only about half of those are coming into the country. Still really, really bad. But half of those are returned back under Title 42. So as bad as the situation is, if Title 42 were to go away, we would, we would be looking at 18,000 apprehensions per day. But half of those people would not be able to be returned back to the border. So that's where we're looking at in terms of the numbers. So you do that on a daily basis, and you're getting up an order of magnitude uh, in a, a very, very large problem uh, if Title 42 goes away. But as of right now, you know, we have a, a, you know, 200,000 per month is, is essentially the problem. Um, and those are the apprehensions. And, and, and Will, you know, that's the whole strategy of the cartel is that they are trying to pr make these apprehensions and, and waste the time of the Border Patrol so that they can get the other things across the border, smuggling, uh, drugs. And that is really... What is so critical about this problem is the apprehensions don't tell the whole story. Tons mm. of people, illegal and aliens, who are coming across, but it really is something where you have the, the, the deterioration of the entire border in a way that I think is, is truly beginning to be historic. So I want to come back to the cartels. I want to come back to their tactics and strategy that you began to lay out right there. But I also want to make sure I get the numbers exactly right. So you said we're roughly at um, 7,000 detentions a day, but half of those, only half of those, return to Mexico under Title 42. So 3,500 detentions a day that are not returned to Mexico. Correct. And you're saying if Title 42 is lifted, and right now it's under injunction from a judge in Louisiana, if it's lifted, it'll rise to 18,000 detentions a day, and none of those return to Mexico. Is my math correct? Your and math is correct. Yeah. Okay, so I take 18,000 a day. I extrapolate that over a month. And just for easy math, I'm going to do 20,000. And I'm looking at 600,000, roughly a month, of illegal immigrants entering the United States of America and not being returned to Mexico. You got it. That's the math. Yep. Okay, so that's essentially... Um, I'm just trying to think of an American city. I'm trying to think of an American city that's about half a million people, 600,000 people. I don't know what that is. Austin, Texas was at one time. It's now well over a million. Um, half a million. What is St. Louis? We're talking about importing a city roughly, and forgive me people from St. Louis to tell me, no, St. Louis is much bigger than 600,000. But we're importing cities, mid-American, fairly large cities every month comprised exclusively of illegal immigrants that you're getting at the the, the the substantive point which is this is this is massive this is on a massive scale um, you don't have the ability to absorb these communities in the amount of time that we're talking about uh, and it's putting great stress on communities across the country not just the border but these border cities are the pipeline to other uh, parts of the country and there's a well-established network of nonprofits that that uh, does that pipeline Right. And so and I don't want to spend our conversation talking, Russ, about Title 42. I think that conversation has been well explained. I guess it's worth just defining our terms. Title 42 is the pandemic era policy to return people because of fears of the spread of covid. Um, the Biden administration wants to repeal that at the same time, by the way, they seem to have renewed concern about covid. Mask policies are coming back in many American cities. But all of a sudden, for immigration purposes, the pandemic is over. I I'm not a big fan, Russ, of the idea of the extension of Title 42. I mm. understand it as a necessity in the moment, but it just can't be our immigration solution, right? I mean, we can't have this Band-Aid on because the pandemic should and will end, and then the problem remains. 
Yeah, no, at some point, you know, Congress needs to step in and give the ability to uh, DHS to have a Title 42 long-term fix. There's, I, I would agree with you. We don't, we don't want the, the, the public health declaration to continue. But I think what's important about this is that it proved in a point that was contested within the Trump administration really until the last year or two within the administration. And that was, you know, you would have the Department of Homeland Security head telling you that you just can't remove people, that uh, it won't work, that you have some kind of Mexican standoff at the border where if you, you bring them, you return them, they're not going to accept them. Uh, that has proven to be uh, completely inaccurate. And, it's, it, and it, is, it has given us at Center for Renewing America the rules of engagement to be able to apply to a different legal theory that we believe would, would secure the border. But it allows you to say, we now have, we have precedent that the Department of Homeland Security knows how to remove people and to be able to do it in a way that will actually stop the flow. I hear you. So what you're saying is Title 42 is proof of concept. We can detain. We can deport. It is a logistical possibility. Exactly. And we're going to get to your proposed solution, which I find fascinating, the declaration of an invasion in just one more minute, because now I want to return to what you said about the cartel. So what you're telling me is, yes, Will, you've characterized the number of people accurately, 600, half a million 600,000, half a million new people every month. But the truth is the cartel is facilitating that illegal immigration as a diversionary tactic. As a diversionary tactic and as a moneymaker for them. I mean, uh, we, we believe that they're making just as much from human smuggling and human trafficking as they make from drug smuggling. Uh, but there is a there is a process to it that is uh, allows them to be able to take their high value uh, things that they're trying to smuggle and have that evade contact with with law enforcement because of how they're strategically using uh, people and sending them in big caravans. You, you when you when you watch the border, you sometimes you might think, well. Why are all these people going as like a big caravan? It's like the easiest thing to identify at all, completely. It's not like they're trying to be that stealth. That's the whole point. They know that our laws are geared against it so that they can then say, because of the way our laws are structured, they can send these groups, mass groups of people, and our, it clogs up our border patrolmen who are basically doing paperwork and then doing effectively catch and release into the interior for all of these individuals. Hey. But the main point there, Will, is that the, the cartels, in a way that I don't think the American people realize, have operational control of the border. They control it. We do not control the border in any way. So that's a stunning statement in and of itself. It's only more so when you compound it with, I think, an equally stunning statement that the cartels are making as much on human smuggling as they are on the illegal drug trade. That, Russ, that's got to be, I mean, everyone listening understands the size of the illegal drug trade. I mean, at least conceptually, we yep. see the we see the wealth, we see the stacks of cash, we've watched the Netflix series, we've seen the movies. To think that there's an equally profitable market in human smuggling is stunning. I'm just curious. I grabbed my phone because I want to pull the calculator up. Do you know at the Center for Renewing America, like, what is the average um, what is the average cost to an illegal, illegal immigrant to a cartel employed coyote to to be shuttled into America? What are they paying? Yeah, I don't have that off the top of my head, but it, it's going to be sizable for them. These are people that are uh, who are coming to America largely for the economic opportunity. And I think that's just one aspect of it, Will, in the sense that um, you know, there are other numbers there, the degree to which people are harmed as a result of dealing with the cartels. I mean, these are not, it is not pain-free for these, these families, these parents, these children to mm -hmm. be going through this pipeline of, that is really hurting them. Uh, and it's one of the reasons, it's really, I think, the untold story of the illegal immigration problem is the extent to which human trafficking is damaging the very lives of the people who are coming. I just picked a number, Russ, by the way. I don't know if it's, I feel like at various times I've heard ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000. I don't know what the number is for the question that I asked you, but I just did my calculator. I did 600000 that's the mm -hmm. number of people described, by $10,000. And I'm a dummy. I don't know how to read my calculator's output, but it's 6E9. So I don't know. I don't know if that's uh, that many zeros, um, if that's what they're making um, a month. And I don't know how that compares to the illicit drug trade, but there's no doubt it's big business. Mm -hmm. So now that gets us to your proposed solution. 
Tell us about the idea of in lieu of the federal government doing their job, and that seems clear, the federal government is not interested in enforcing the border. In lieu of that, what states like Texas or Arizona can do to begin to control the border through the declaration of an invasion? Great. Uh, So we go back to the Constitution, and we know that there have been, under federal immigration laws, there have been adverse opinions uh, U.S. v. Arizona that say, I don't, I don't think those, they were decided rightly, but they have said that these court cases, that the federal government's responsible for immigration laws and that states have largely been precluded up until now. We went back to the Constitution and we looked at the language of it and we said uh, Article 1, Section 10, Clause 3 allows for the commander in chief of a state to be able to use authorities that were largely retained under the Constitution to protect their people from an invasion. And this is tied up with Article 4, Section 4, in which the federal government is, is, is intended to protect the people from invasion. And we believe that the, the clear language of Article 1, Section 10, Clause 3 allows, it's a, it's a whole section about what the states cannot do unless and this is, this is, they cannot exercise military power, commander-in-chief-like authority, unless facing an invasion. And we believe, we did some research, and we realized that this invasion was not meant to just get at uh, nation states. It was not meant to just get at uh, terrorist organizations. It was meant to get at things like drugs, uh, smugglers at the time. It was certainly intended for uh uh, Indian nations, it was uh, militias. There was a whole context of things that that clause was intended for. And remember, at the time, you didn't have the Border Patrol. The states were doing a lot, a lot of their, their own work at the borders to the extent that they were enforcing them. And this is something that we believe is entirely uh, credible. And what it looks like in practice is very simple. And it's why I wanted to uh, spend some time on the Title 42 point. All it would be is to say, Governor Abbott, Governor Ducey, the other two, if they were ever willing to think about it, is to say, we're facing an invasion. We are, we are citing our authority under Article 1, Section 10, Clause 3. Here are specific rules of engagement to your sheriffs, who would be deputized, your state troopers, your National Guardsmen, to say, you have rules of engagement to interdict and remove them immediately to the border and what we have found is that that would stop the flow when the when the cartels when the people back home in central america know okay it's not open season on the border there's not a neon light that says come that will stop the flow when they see people that left two weeks ago or a month ago uh come back because it's no longer there that is the kind of thing that will will change the problem in 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 a fundamental way okay so Sometimes I like to restate things, Russ, to make sure that I get them correct in my head. And then by repeating them, I hope that I also can do the same thing for my audience. Let me see if I understand everything you've laid out correctly. First, the Supreme Court of the United States has said that border enforcement is exclusively within the realm of the federal government. In essence, prior Supreme Court decisions have kneecapped state government, state law enforcement from doing anything to enforce the border. So a lot of people listening or watching on Fox at times say, why doesn't Governor Abbott do something? Why don't you do something? And it's his belief up to this point, well, I don't have the ability. The Supreme Court has said I can't. It's a federal government exclusive job, correct? Correct. Okay. Now you have found and you and your institution and your research are looking and you say Article One, I believe you said Article One, Section Ten, Clause Three. Yep. Um, lays out in its inception, by the way, in, in the Constitution's inception that state governments can protect themselves in the face of an invasion. Now, for anyone listening, I think we all think, okay, invasion. We do think nation state, as you mentioned. So in other words, Mexico invades Texas. Well, Texas can deputize its sheriffs and Texas can can mar- mobilize any type of law enforcement it has to repel that invasion. And what you're telling me is you have historical context to say, no, you're not limited to the scenario you just described, Will. I have historical examples of how – a state has been invaded and has been constitutionally allowed to do something about that invasion? Definitely in terms of the thought process of the founders, what they were relying on in in drawing terms from the Articles of Confederation. Um, And we put this out in terms of of 
the founders' understanding. Interestingly, Attorney of General Arizona, who endorsed this legal theory, uh, also cited this understanding of the words of the founder and how they were using it in, in their originalist context. Uh, and, and that's precisely people who think, you know, there's always a little bit of a, a gap with, with policymakers because they think that we're, we're asking them to do what uh, er, the, the Supreme Courts have said they can't do. And we're very conscious to say, myself or Ken Cuccinelli, who's really been our lead on this, we are not talking for purposes of this about immigration law, federal immigration law. We are talking about the self-help provisions that are embedded in the Constitution specifically to ensure what common sense would dictate, which is a governor should be allowed to protect his people. And what are those? I think, and we're going to address your critics in, in one moment, yeah. but there is a really generalized belief, I think it's fair to say, a generalized belief that these powers are, they are found in wartime for states. It's a wartime scenario. Please give me, you, you said something about Indian tribes, you said something about historically with smugglers. Can you give me historical examples of where this power has been exercised by states in the past? Yeah, we don't know if they have actually declared the invasion in, in the sense of Article 1, Section 10, Clause 3. But, but states have, have skirmished along the, the Mexican border previously. I mean, at one point, you know, uh, th there was – you're trying to, to capture uh, uh, Indians along those, that area. So that's, that's something that's, that's out there. Are you – and just – I'm going to inject some of my own personal curiosities and knowledges. Are you, are you talking, for example – I'm very – Russ, I'm very into reading about Comanche history and Texas yeah. Ranger history. Are, are you talking about that kind of thing where the Texas Rangers would literally um, trail Comanche Indian tribes because they didn't recognize any international borders, right? They would raid and then abscond back to Mexico or off to West Texas or the Apaches as well. Are you talking about scenarios like that? Because it is a state institution, by the way. Texas yeah. Rangers, historically, would that be an accurate example? That would be that would be the kind of example that we are, are, are looking to citing that has happened. That you know there is a they were well within their rights to do that, and they weren't outside of the law in doing so. Uh, and so th those are the kinds of scenarios that you know we're we're looking at to ensure uh, that it's it's common sense. The states have the ability to do this, and then of course uh, you know bring it fast forward to the present in the types of situations. What's key here, Will, to your point about how the American people would perceive this, we're not saying invade Mexico. We're not saying right. that they, you know, you use this authority in a way that's offensive. And we're not saying that this is, we're asking you to use military force against uh, the individuals in this context. What we are saying is, in the same way you would have uh, military-like authorities to deal with prisoners of war, that's the kind of analogy that this is drawing on to say we're interdicting you we're removing you uh, it is all part of what we believe constitutes an invasion based on what we're seeing along the border i'm going to stay on this historical note for one more minute because i'm sure you're aware you know i know for sure that governor abbott would be aware if i did something like this i'm going to end up in court and i'm going to inevitably end up at the supreme court of the united states and i know that those justices would look back to historical precedent so i mean literally what you and i talked about it may be texas rangers versus comanches that ends up being the historical precedent of these types of powers do you have anything russ a little more on the nose because you did say something about smugglers so do you have anything more on the nose historically where you suspect these powers enable the state to fight smugglers, international smugglers? Not off the top of my head, no. But, you know, this is the types of things that they would have been concerned about when they were writing the documents and the words that they were put in place. You know, the thing about the court case, Will, is that we have, we have found lines of cases in which the, this is ultimately a political question. So we, we do believe that this will end up in court. But the administration will have to will have to prove the case that they are not invaded, uh, mm -hmm. and that'll be a hard case for them to to prove. And so, uh, you know, we deal with liberal judges every single day. Of course, that there's ways for them to construe uh, what they want to construe. But from a legal perspective, both in terms of how the courts are are taught to be able to consider cases, this is largely something that rests in the eye of the beholder in this case, the state of Texas or, or, or Arizona, to be able to make this case and, and have it trusted by the, the other constitutional actors. So do I understand your argument correctly as well when we say the invader in this declaration of an invasion isn't necessarily the illegal immigrant? 
it is the cartel that is the invader. Am I understanding your argument correctly, or is it both? I know that the cartels play a central role in your argument. It, I would say it's broader than how you stated it, Will, in the sense that I don't want people to conclude that the masses of, of people that are coming across that are part of the cartel's business, that they themselves are not part of what we're talking about. And if you didn't have the the, it, you didn't have a, the cartel that's trying to make money and, and controlling you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of a third of Mexico, that that somehow wouldn't be an invasion. I think it's an added part of the fact pattern. But the sheer numbers of people that we're talking about, uh, if someone like you or I were trying to get in, rally them together to come across, the sheer number, just because they are, are, not, uh, they are not armed, that that would constitute an invasion as well. But I think the added part of the cartels makes this a very, very compelling case from our standpoint. OK, so you, you would you would think you'd be on safe ground to declare an invasion whether or not the cartel existed. But you think it is a compounding factor that helps solidify the case of an invasion? Correct. OK, um, let's take let's take on a few of the criticisms really quickly. And not all of them come from the left, by the way. I think the left's general argument is either very shallow um, and probably would declare in response to your declaration racism in some way. Yep. How dare you declare people um, migrant status, they would say, or refugee status invaders. Um, but then they would say you just don't have constitutional authority. And then we end up in our we end up in our, our legal fight. But the Republican side, for example, why hasn't Governor Abbott done anything yet? And he spent years as attorney general before governor. And he says his fallback line is, I've been studying this, right? And he has issued a few quotes, um, and one of them is seems to be more logistical in his criticism, that it would create a revolving door, that you just – these are people who have been presumably, I think, detained, then released, and then picked up by Texas, and then – shuttled out by Texas. So he's saying they'd have the ability to just walk right back in. So you just create this revolving door that doesn't really do anything to stem the tide. Yeah, I think the answer to that one is we've seen over the last two years that that's not the case when you're using Title 42. So he and his attorney general are in court as part of the Title 42 lawsuits. And the premise of why they're fighting so hard on that point is to essentially use the same rules of engagement under a different legal authority to be able to turn people back across the border and stop the flow. And so so long as the, the, the flow is stopped and people realize, I mean, this is not like, hey, come across the border, you return, you go two miles down the road and you can get across. It has to be part of a, a, a enough of a, a comprehensive effort to make sure that the games aren't being played and there's enough troops, uh, you know, whether that's the sheriffs, the state troopers, etc., to be able to make sure that this is a real, uh, a, a, you know, a tightening of the corridor in a way that actually stops the flow. And I think the first part of your question, you know, his reluctance to do this, I think is largely we're now in a posture in this country where states are reluctant to do battle with the federal government. And they're just they're not used to thinking about uh, constitutional brinksmanship in that way. And I think that's what he has been struggling with. Um, I actually take it as good news that he's studying it. Uh, you know, for a long time, he tried to long ignore time. this like a long time. He tried to ignore this like a fly. Uh, we're now to the point where he is studying it and getting his mind wrapped around it. I think there might be one other reason for hesitation. And that leads me to one of my final questions for you here as we we had. Um, toward the end of our interview, but and that is logistics. Would you tell me once more how you envision the logistics working? It's the National Guard mobilized by the governor or sheriffs or Texas DPS or Texas Rangers um, serving in the function of detaining illegal immigrants and literally deporting them. How does it work? Sure. The, I would put the emphasis on the interdict. We do not envision this as them uh, detaining them for long and needing to have structures that the federal government would have and state doesn't. Uh, we really want to model this, like you said, on the proof of concept of Title 42, which is to say we're going to interdict you and we're going to remove you within two hours. And Ken would have a, 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 a fact there where he would say we were able to do maybe like 85 percent of the removals within two hours. And all we would do is we'd want to, like, make sure you take their their fingerprints and give them enough uh, food and nutrition to get them through the day and get them over the border. And really, it's as simple as that, so long as you have enough uh 
people that are part of the operation. And then you would need to do some deputizing of sheriffs. But when I was down there in Del Rio, I asked the, the state troopers who are doing Operation Lone Star, which we both commend the people who are away from their families doing it uh, and also recognizing where it is falling short. And I asked them point blank, if you were to give, be given this very novel uh, uh, expectation from your governor, would you be able to do this? And, and, and they said, absolutely, with relish, we'd be able to do this and to do it well. Would Mexico have to be a willing partner? No, they would not have to be a willing partner, but I think that they would. I mean, I think over the last four years, Mexico has proven, but whether that's remain in Mexico, that they are not, they are, they are not going to do what they need to do to be able to create the, the, the situation of a Mexican standoff, as fallacious as I think that, that concern is. Mexico has largely, at one point, they were largely helping us enforce their, their, their border by keeping people from coming up Central America to the border because they were so scared of us turning off trade uh, at points of entry. Mm. And then this leads me back to why my suspicion, one of the reasons um, there would be some hesitation, and that is, can Texas afford to do so? Wait, before you answer that, would then state law enforcement, they would only be able to do this on state property, right? Anything that's federal property would theoretically still be under the control of the Border Patrol, and then that wouldn't be subject to whatever the state could do under this invasion declaration. No, we don't believe that. We believe that they, are, they have the ability to go on federal land as well. Um, oh. I think you might have an issue with, you know, like a military base and standpoint of, you know, walls and structures and things like that. But our view is that the the, the state, the commander in chief of the state government uh, has the authority to do this uh, across the border. Can you imagine a standoff between, say, Texas DPS and Border Patrol in that scenario then? So this is actually the main argument that Abbott will make, that he's trying to get his mind wrapped around. And we don't think it's as, it, it is a, a concern. Um First of all, uh, the border is very big. So as you're enforcing your border, uh, there are places to go where Border Patrol, if given an order, which I don't think that they would enforce, these are people that are standing up with in, 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 uh, in, on, their, on their cell phone and, and experiencing a lot of pushback to their superiors who are not giving them the ability to do their job. I don't believe that they, this is a scenario it is, that is realistic, that the federal government is going to come in and start arresting uh, state troopers who are doing are, are working under constitutional authority. But that's the thing that presumed, is, presumed constitutional presumed, authority, because what you're talking about is when it's in limbo. You're talking right. about while it's in constitutional limbo, Texas DPS doing a job and the federal government instructing Border Patrol or – whoever within federal law enforcement to start arresting Texas law enforcement for doing something the federal government says you cannot do. Yeah. And I and again, I, I don't think that there's a scenario in which a Border Patrol and I've met these guys is going to have the capacity or the willingness to go and try to, to do something like that at the request of superiors here in, here in D.C. I think this is large, particularly if the state leans in on the front end to say we're not going to let this happen. We are going to construct uh, our, our uh, the individuals performing this operation so that this is not something that uh, is is employed in part because we don't have they don't have the legal authority to do it and we have the legal authority to do it. It's, it's the same in the same way. It's a it's an issue for the governor to think through. It's the very same issue that the that the federal government has to think through because they don't have the authority to do that either. You think that's you think that's Governor Abbott's hesitation of this 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 concept of a standoff between Border Patrol and Texas DPS, the federal government and his law enforcement like that is an image and a situation that nobody wants to really envision literally a standoff, an armed standoff over a potential arrest. I would have to think, Russ, that would be a that's not that's no small theoretical hypothetical hiccup. Uh, any politician is going to be running afraid of that scenario and what you're saying is well the federal politicians will as well you're saying Correct. basically everyone's afraid of it so do it anyway well I, I, I wouldn't want to be flippant about it but i do believe this gets to that first part of my argument which is the constitutional brinksmanship that the states have for a long time fallen back from is required and this is why this is a, a historic paradigm, but we believe it's one that there's legal grounds to. And we're at the point in this country where 
constitutional actors at the state government have to press the point. Right. And then they've, you know, there's a whole lot of ways that this can go in court and, and, and others, but they've got to be able to, to create that brinksmanship to force the issue. Last two questions. Can states like Texas or Arizona actually afford financially to do this? I do believe so. I mean, when we were out in Arizona, we stood with a third of the legislature there calling on Ducey to do this. And it was a third of the legislature saying, if you do this, we'll get your back with with the resource to do it. Mm -hmm. Again, they're already doing things. The question is, are they being put to good use? So they're already spending this money. And I don't believe it requires a bunch of detaining facilities that's going to give people the ability to stay here uh, permanently or, or enjoy you know, those, those facilities, the way the, the federal UAC program works. So I do think that they can afford it. Um, and I think it's, it's vital that, they, that the, the legislatures back their governors up if, if it's required. And last question, do you, what do you think will happen? Do you think your proposal will be accepted by, I mean, the most likely candidates are Texas, to a greater extent, perhaps Arizona, not so much New Mexico or California. Do you think any of these state leaders will declare an invasion to exercise this authority? I do. I think that right now all the governors that are running on the Republican side, the candidates, have endorsed this theory in some form or fashion. So I think this is going to happen if Republicans continue control in Arizona as early as next year. And I think at that point, if Governor Abbott hasn't already acted, and I take him at his word that he's in good faith studying this. I think it had happened before in Texas. I think this will happen after Arizona occurs. There's no way that Arizona is going to move forward with this when they have an attorney general opinion saying you can do it. And mm. Texas is not going to move. And then you've got two out of the three main illegal immigration states uh, moving. And do I think that this is going to happen in Democrat states? No. But it does change their 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 facts on the ground when they have the entirety of the country's illegal immigration going through their those two states. That's immensely destabilizing for even Democrat states to deal with. So I, I think we'll have a, quite a bit of improvement by, by mid next year. All right, Russ, it is, it is, I think the word is, I don't know if the word is unconventional. I, I think the word is novel, although we point back to some historical context, but it is a, a very interesting theory of approach to how to begin to establish some control of our southern border. And I really appreciate you laying it out for us today on the Will Cain podcast. Thanks, Will. Appreciate it.